Meditation doesn't have to be sitting still and having an empty mind. The journey is such a beautiful thing because we are all on a journey. You want to make sure you have some kind of distribution plan, or at least have an idea of it, because you can make this really amazing film and it only gets seen by your family and friends. Old Hollywood is still intact. Every horse runs hard, but when they win, and they know it. They've got this little sass about them. It was pretty rough. I had to go into the water and with my med pack, swim to the beach, treat these guys, put them on my back, swim out to the helo. And I'm like, oh my God, I've never seen those before. And I said, what are those? And before I could even finish the sentence, she said, oh my God, you didn't touch them, did you? Even if monarchs go away and we never see one again, because there never will be monarchs again if they die out, it is just a little indicator of larger threats yeah. My dad said, so what were you guys doing in the desert? And I said, we were taking nude photos. <laughs> hey everybody, welcome back to the Queen Trail Podcast. I hope that you had a great week since the last time that we got together. You might have noticed that I have a new intro. It was so much fun putting it together, even though it was really hard to try to figure out which clips I was going to use because there's so many great ones. But if you usually skip past that intro, go back and give it a listen. It's about 90 seconds of bite-sized clips from just a few of the great talks from the past 52 weeks. Yes, 52 weeks. I can't believe it. And in case you missed it, I started out the new podcast year with a couple of medleys of longer clips that are a great way for you to hear what the Queen Trail podcast is all about. So if you go back and listen to episodes 51 and 52, they are jam packed with amazing talks in storybook style. So it's easy to listen to a whole bunch of them in one sitting or one drive or one house cleaning, (laughs) however it is that you listen to this podcast, give them a listen today and share them with friends. Speaking of friends, I am super excited to share with you my latest in the company of friends talk with my friend Phil Warren. Phil is a senior engineer in research and development. He's a color specialist and an encoder with a long history as a web developer photographer and graphic designer. And he's also a little bit of a mad scientist turning out amazing creations that include photography aids and programs, which we'll discuss a little bit more in detail here. He's also an adventurer, a world traveler, a photojournalist with a taste for the edgy and the exotic stories. So In the first part of the episode, we geek out on color science. It's fascinating and informative, and I love this stuff. Eventually, it wonderfully and oddly leads to the last part where we're going to discuss his journalistic coverage of such things as, wait for it, the world's largest rattlesnake roundup in Sweetwater, Texas, high altitude alligator wrestling in Colorado, and so much more. In fact... It's so much amazing, interesting information. And so this is really only part one of a two-part episode. So please grab a cuppa and join Phil Warren and me in this latest In the Company of Friends talk. Enjoy. I guess it, it might be fitting to talk a little bit about image technology, which is really my bread and butter. It's what I've spent more or less my lifetime working in, in in one form or the other. And I'd like to think I've made some contributions to uh, society as a whole with uh, new inventions and new techniques, a form of both photography and video. I've been working for the last 12 years and nine months at Dolby Labs. I'm now a senior research engineer. Uh, We'll be at Dolby for a few more days. But at Dolby, I've primarily worked in video. And this this involves helping write the 3D extension for H.264, uh, a popular video codec, and then being instrumental in developing the high dynamic range aspects, or HEVC, of um, H.265. 
for the lay people of the world that might be listening. What does that entail, the 3D extension for the H.264 Kodak, as as well as the HEVC for the H.265? Well, basically, HEVC stands for High Efficiency Video Coding. And uh, as we develop newer, shinier, more spectacular technologies, they, they take up more space. There's more bits. They're, they're what we would call bit hungry. So you have to dump more data to describe what you're seeing. And back in the days of when uh, 3D was popular, you were really actually presenting two images at once. You're presenting a left eye and a right eye. And something I worked with for a while was actually even presenting that as a depth map so that you could recreate basically a hologram with it, which was really neat. Um, But anyway, as you develop uh, these more and more data-hungry processes, you have to develop a better way to pack that in. So I I can't claim to be solely responsible, but I did support the encoding team at Dolby. So we we worked, and I I primarily coded simulations and tests and would design and lead human experimentation where we would show a bunch of people these clips that I had simulated various encodings and just ask them like, hey, which of these looks better? Like, you like this one? You like this one? And four hours of looking at 15 second clips later, we've got a whole bunch of test data that tells us what images encoded the best, which is pretty neat. A little boring at times because encoding isn't always the most extravagant thing, but it, I'd like to think, helped things a lot. We use these in pretty much all modern forms of video now, so anything you fire up in, I want to say Netflix, though they might have shifted away from H.265. Um, I cannot remember off the top of my head, but that's, that's some of the more dry things I've done. I also got to design and lead some experiments that uh, basically remapped human vision, because there's this really cool thing. Uh, Almost everything we know about human vision, at least in terms of reproducing it for media, was based on these experiments done in 1931 called CIE 1931. And they were done with rare earth phosphors. And and they asked these 12 test subjects to try and recreate colors that they were shown on one side of this experiment with a series of light bulbs and some knobs. And basically, you could sort of, in a very rudimentary way, uh, reverse engineer how the human eye saw color based on these experiments and uh, how it could best be recreated in a a faithful way that all people would see. Um, Only problem is there were only 12 test subjects. They were all men. Two of them we now believe to have been colorblind. Oh, no. No. And uh, just the tech of the, the 1930s was not great. It was clever. It was genius. But we've been exceeding the color that, that rare earth phosphors can offer us for quite some time. And, and in the modern era, we're now using these nanocrystalline particles called quantum dots in TVs that can show this dizzying array of colors that, that far exceeds what, what rare earth phosphors ever could. And these nanocrystalline particles are so neat. You hit them with a, a little blast of UV, and they fluoresce in these hyper-saturated colors. It's, it's really neat. And you can just honestly get TVs with these particles in them just off the shelves now at your local Walmart, which is pretty neat. The advancement of technology, right? I mean, it's yeah. just, it's wild. And I remember I was listening to somebody talking about how the pace of technology is speeding up. Like it almost doubles as as we get more technology in place that helps us achieve whatever it is that we're trying to achieve. That lessens the advancement rate so that it's just going faster and faster. So when did that technology come out, the nanoparticles? God, well, so I flew to Japan with a prototype in a suitcase in 2014 with those quantum dot nanoparticles. So I I don't know when those were actually discovered, but if if the earlier prototypes were in the 2010s, uh, I can say about 10 years. 
if you start, you know, just kind of going back and seeing what the predecessor of the quantum dot was, like what the time period between that discovery and the quantum dot nanoparticles is, time is just speeding up. It's kind of a Moore's law where almost every two years, the uh, the microchip of, of art is going to be twice as dense and twice as powerful. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Moore's law was an observation stating that there would be uh, kind of a, I guess that would be exponential growth of, mm-hmm. of technology. Although I believe the first year that that did not come to pass was pretty recently. Um, which is scary. We might have hit the the terminus point of how densely we can pack microprocessors, which now we can maybe open the doors of quantum processing, which ironically has nothing to do with quantum dots, really. Yes, yeah, so Moore said that the transistor density would double every two years. And that lasted for four decades. And it looks like... Uh, 2016 was when that broke. Wow. That's amazing because you kind of think that this is going to happen into infinity, but it actually has a finite capacity. Yeah. I wonder if it's asymptotic just because of material sciences. You can't jam transistors that dense. Eventually, atoms can't be made smaller. And you run into Brownian noise that's going to just mess that up at a a very subatomic level. Um, But, uh, you know, that just means we have to invent in other directions, which I I find really exciting. Like, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. So if we want to take things faster and denser, we got to think outside the box, develop a new technology, which is neat. Right. And that's just part of your personality, I think, you know, just taking a look at how much inventing you do, actually, all the things that you have re-engineers. I think one of the things I saw was a fun uh, a fun light inside of your home. I don't remember exactly what that was. Well, one thing, I can't even really take credit for this, but it was discovered that uh, most of the IKEA furniture and lights that have LEDs in them, you can just pull out the microcontroller that comes with a lamp. That's exactly where I was going. (laughs) Yeah, you can throw in your own Zigbee controller, and then whatever like cheap $20 lamp you had was suddenly a smart light, and you can now shout at your house to to make it change colors. So I have a a glowing head that wears a weird owl wig, and it it can change colors to match my couch, and that's pretty neat and did a, a similar hack to a little corgi toy. And, you know, it's 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 neat to be handy and, and tinkery because sometimes if there's no inspiration for a, a new invention, sometimes just making your house a little magical is, is nice and fun. Definitely. You recently made a chandelier tree, cigar box guitar, um... The, uh, though the cigar box guitar was actually my old roommate made that for me. He's got quite the ear for music, really talented guy named Tony Bonando. Uh, but yeah, I, I built a chandelier tree in my backyard. As some Angelinos might know, there was a somewhat famous installation in Silver Lake, uh, the Silver Lake chandelier tree, and the city actually shut it down um, mm. in, I want to say, 2019. So the chandelier tree went dark for Los Angeles. And when I got a house, I really wanted to bring that magic here. So while this chandelier tree isn't in my front yard, you can see it from quite a few blocks away in my backyard. It extends well above my house. I have a dozen chandeliers in it right now, all upcycled. They were all someone's garbage. I haven't paid for one of them. But I rewired, sealed, and engineered all the the chandeliers so that they can be safely used outside, hopefully. Um, And yeah, they're all mounted with stainless steel pulleys so I can drop them and take care of them as weather does what weather will to them. Mm -hmm. But it really creates a pretty magical environment. I like it. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Um, 
So I got a little bit away from what we were originally talking about, just because you said that, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And, you know, once you get to that point where the transistor density is so great that you just can't pack anything else in there, you need to go into another direction. What are some other times where, or some other inventions that have come up that you've been a part of? Let's see, my independent research, I've had some things that I'm quite proud of. Um, One of my favorite things is looking to technology from the distant, distant past and figuring out how those ideas can be incorporated in the modern world. A big thing, and I can't take a lot of credit for this, but Ptolemy in 150 AD was the first person to commit to writing this idea of what we would call stereographic projections. And it's this really cool idea of looking up at the the celestial heavens and seeing this kind of sphere above you and wondering, how can I take this giant curved surface and project it down onto a two-dimensional sheet? How how would Ptolemy look at the stars and and commit them to uh, an illustration? And he came up with this idea of flattening a spherical image the way you might flatten an orange peel or or more accurately a balloon if you were just to stretch it down and distort it heavily to place it on a thing. And what happens is, uh, well, first off, you need a spherical image. And maybe you etched the stars onto a glass globe, held it over a candle, and then lifted that glass globe. But in our case, what we started to see uh, a few years ago, that with VR taking off, all virtual reality images are photospheres. So you can use the stereographic projection that Ptolemy developed on consumer virtual reality cameras and then make uh, what I call tiny planets. Uh, Actually, I guess what people on the internet by and large call tiny planets. And it... uh, it makes it look like this camera is hovering hundreds of feet above you and you're standing on this small planet and the horizon wraps in a tight circle around you. And it's, it's really novel and, and, and silly. Um, but something I came up with was a rig that would rotate a modified infrared camera around a hypothetical infinitely small point and you could visualize this, this infrared world using that stereographic projection, and uh, I call those infrared tiny planets. They're up on my Instagram, and and you see the world in this dizzying array of candy colors as uh, you sort of remap the photons that the human eyes couldn't have seen into a visible spectrum in this really novel layout. I just realized trying, trying to describe an image like that is probably not going to do it justice. Showing the image might be the best way. If anyone wants to take a look, philwarrenphotography.com has some of my infrared tiny planets up. And then also some other uh, historical recreations I've looked into doing. I worked for a while with some color scientists up in San Francisco on trying to recreate uh, tintype photography from the 1850s. Uh, in the modern digital world, because meeting tintype photographers, which is this this great antiquated photographic technique that sort of burns images onto an iron plate, like a old steampunk Polaroid. Mm-hmm. But uh, doing this requires so many dangerous chemicals that, frankly, are difficult to come by, and you just shouldn't do this. It's it's not safe. Uh, whether through asphyxiation, uh, explosion, or frankly, even a, a splash of the, the silver developer will leave you blind. So it's it's a really dangerous hobby, and in my mind, a little elitist too. The, the tintype photographers I know can't really welcome anyone else into this scene because unless you have the resources for an antique camera, a developing studio, and a way to deal with all these chemicals, you just aren't going to do this. So I did a bunch of research into how one could modify a camera by tearing out some internal sensors and then putting some external filters over it to recreate this this form of photography. 
And what we discovered is if you look at photos from the 1850s, you see that these, these cowboys look road hard and put away wet. Like they are grizzled, just sun beaten, and uh, they don't look good. They look right. amazing, but they don't look pretty. Uh, and come to find out, it's because the photography of that time, the, the emulsion surface captured outside of the human visible spectrum, it was sensitive to the colors that the human eye couldn't see, namely the ultraviolet spectrum. Not all the way down, but a good healthy chunk of ultraviolet combined with the blues and greens that the human eye could see. And what that meant is sun damage was exaggerated. Uh, every wrinkle, mm-hmm. every mole, freckles that wouldn't have been seen by the human eye would, would pop to the image and um, really exaggerated the humanity. You could It looked like you were looking into their soul when you look into these pictures. Yeah, they all kind of look like a little bit like uh, they're turning into zombies or something. There's that zombie effect to it. Well, that's that's a little more infrared. Um, these tend to, hopefully, really exaggerate the emotion, whereas infrared on the other side of that spectrum, which I've done some work in, that smooths out the skin but makes your eyes just jet black and you're looking at these soulless demons. Uh, <laughs> they look young and sexy, but horrific and emotionless and dead <laughs> behind the eyes. Yeah, I'm looking at, by the way, your infrared tiny planets on your website, Phil Warren Photography. I'll put the link on the on the show notes. These are phenomenal. Well, thank you. Yeah, these are amazing. Um, and it kind of looks like a Japanese garden, maybe in pink snowy day or something with all the trees around it. And there's a deck. Yeah, I do a lot of these at uh, the Huntington Library. Oh, okay. And really, uh, well, also quite a few at the L.A. Arboretum, I suppose. Looks like I have about a dozen of these up there. And then one at the old abandoned water park deep in the Mojave, which I was pretty proud of. But, um, you know, I, I'd taken this whole yeah, this rig. Yeah, pretty nice. Yeah, thank you. I took this whole rig to Ireland, traveling with one of my friends, and we'd hiked up to this 4,000-year-old cairn that had all these standing stones and a circle of tiny stones from a bygone religion that no one really knows what this was, uh, presumably something Celtic, but they're not really sure. Um, and I was really excited to set up my infrared rig and take an infrared tiny planet. And then once I took the tiny planet, it just looks like a circle of green. <laughs> it turns out oh. that uh, it was not the ideal environment for uh, for an infrared tiny planet. Interesting. Is that because there wasn't e- enough trees, enough features yeah. that stood out? It wasn't anything on the horizon. It was just mm. sort of a, a field with a few stones. So it turns out that that kind of photography isn't the best for <laughs> for capturing ruins, I suppose. Yeah, interesting. I see our our lovely friend Sandra there. These black and whites that you have yeah. are really beautiful. I had to write my own software for color balancing these because mm. now that you've torn out the way by which the the camera would typically see the world, it doesn't know how to record the data. So you do have to write your own stuff. So I just banged out a little Python code and it uh, sort of rearranges all the data into this point cloud and then looks to where the very bright points are and the very dark points are, sets those to gray, and then color balance is worked out. Then you can move it into black and white, and it uh, really preserves that tonality quite well. It's good to know how to write code when you're working with technology like that that you know nobody else has used. It's lovely. And then you meet a lot of purists, people who try and code in a very specific language. And it gets real frustrating because uh, there's no universal code. Not, not everyone knows how to write C++. Not everyone knows how to write Python. So 
really being able to work with variety and, and drop in and out of projects in the community is has been helpful for me over the years because I don't really commit to any one thing. But I know a lot of the researchers I work with tend to use software called MATLAB, and that's real popular with the PhDs. Can do some powerful things. But anyway, it's it's neat to try and divorce my projects or decouple my projects from the code and have the philosophy rock solid. So if need be, I can just recode this in whatever any team is working with. And that's fun. That's important to be able to, to be able to translate it between the codes. Yeah. So coding's a, a thing I, I like to do on the side, but is by no means the crux of how I think about projects or the world. Yeah. So you hold a press pass through the Photographers Association. I do. I maintain a, a membership with the National Press Photographers Association. So I really like having the, the credibility of that organization as I do my own photojournalism uh, around America and around the world. I was photographing a, a coup in Thailand, um, but I, I'm not a conflict photographer. I was just just a tourist with a camera when the coup broke out and I happened to be there. It's like, oh, cool. I'm going to photograph some young soldiers overthrowing the government? Question mark. And this was... Oh God, 2012, 2013. And, uh, I really... and you're, you're probably the only one that's going, Oh, cool. Everybody else is going, Oh shit. And they're like probably running yeah. away and you're running towards the chaos and everybody's <laughs> running the other way. They'd set up these blockades in, uh, Chiang Mai, Thailand. And I remember photographing a, a guy who looked so young. He looked like he was 14 or 15 holding a gun at the North gate of the city. And, um, I, even really do anything with those photos but it's been commented that like what what was i doing what if things had gone wrong that 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 was a silly way to to have risked my life so getting some affiliation with a a, a official group has helped so yeah since then i've enjoyed traveling visiting fringe events Um, i got to cover the world's largest rattlesnake roundup in west texas And I didn't even know there was really one rattlesnake roundup, much less so many to warrant some sort of ranking system. But they do this yearly cull where they throw a big festival, but the the town of Sweetwater, Texas basically exists under a tidal wave of rattlesnakes. Mm -hmm. And in order to maintain public safety, just keep their, not only their cattle and their livelihood from being killed by rattlesnakes, but keep the children from being bit by rattlesnakes. They take to the streets and catch rattlesnakes, and uh, then we fry them and eat them. So they, they really? make a, Yeah, they make a big old thing out of it. Um, I'd heard, basically, one of the best stories I've ever heard in my life on the moth was a blind man who had gone blind when he was about 18, but he had enough time. He was told by a doctor that, like, well in a year, you're not really going to be able to see anymore. So he had done all this research into what like the Eiffel Tower of Sound would be like. So what what tourist destinations could he go to once he was blind, where he could still experience life? And he decided that a rattlesnake roundup, well, the the, the cacophony of four tons of rattlesnakes rattling (laughs) simultaneously would be a thing for him to experience. And hearing that story from him was so amazing. I was so inspired. I was like, I have to go check this out. And they open it with a beauty pageant, uh, Miss Snake Charmer. Um, (laughs) I'd never been to a beauty pageant before, really even thought about a beauty pageant before, Um, especially in small town West Texas. Got to photograph that, got to chat with them. And then they set up these skinning pits. So there's contests to see who can catch the most rattlesnakes. And I don't know exactly what the ins and outs of those are, how big the teams are, but people come and dump all their rattlesnakes into this one giant pit of rattlesnakes. And then there's a a guy with a snow shovel literally turning over the rattlesnakes to make sure they don't hurt each other and smother each other. But then they pull them out and these teenage beauty queens skin them and they sign the wall of the skinning pit behind them dot their eyes with little hearts and then 
put their bloody handprints on the, the wall. And it is, uh, whew, it's a lot. Wow, that sounds so, I don't know if the word is primitive or, you know, something out of Mad Max. Yeah, it, it, it it's interesting because, you know, of course, being on the West Coast, to a lot of my friends, this seems like literal insanity. But, you know, I, I already eat meat, um, and I feel like if there ever was an ethical meat, it's something that is not only raised naturally, not farmed, uh, but something that poses a public safety hazard, so would have to be eliminated anyway, I guess. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess this is the meat to eat. So are the snakes, I just have to ask because they're throwing them in these pits and then these beauty queens are coming over to skin them. Um, are they being skinned alive or do they... Um... Oh, that's a very interesting and interesting and grotesque subject. Uh, no, they're yeah. they're decapitated. Uh, okay. But the, there's a fascinating thing that the independent parts of the snake continue to work well after being separated from one another, which is horrific. Uh, but they're decapitated and you have to be very careful because the head does not know that it's separated from the body, so it can continue to track you with its eyes and bite you for 24 hours. Um, oh my god. So once they're decapitated, they have to machete that head over into a bucket, and then everyone stays the hell away from the bucket of death. It still has the venom glands and the biting. Um, but then the bodies continue to move and writhe, and it's it's a lot if you're not used to it. And, and most people aren't, right? I mean, yeah. I, I'm trying to imagine this and I've got, I literally have goosebumps coming up and, and a little bit of uh, that sense, like, I don't yeah. think I could stand there and watch this. It just sounds yeah. so grotesque. I, I, don't, I don't think most people uh, should. <laughs> it's, um, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's an, a uniquely unpleasant thing. Um, Years and years ago, I, I lived in China, in Hong Kong, as a fake flower photographer. I was a product photographer um, for a fake flower import company. And there was a snake shack uh, where they make snake soup. And I remember this. This was really my first time spending significant amounts of time abroad. I was young in my early 20s, I want to say 22 maybe. And I remember sitting in front of that snake shack watching this guy, he called himself the Cobra King, mm -hmm. watching him decapitate these huge cobras. And, and again, that phenomenon of all the parts still moving, no matter what state of preparation they're in. It was, it was a lot. And that was my first time seeing it, but also left me somewhat psychologically prepared to see the same thing in West Texas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It sounds like they've got a very complex nervous system. Um, yeah. Just a, a huge excess number of nerves going through them. And I've never seen a chicken be killed, but when they are separated of their heads, I've heard that they still will run around. And hence the term running around like a chicken with his head cut off. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't know if that's due to nervous complexity or nervous simplicity. Um, I honestly could not opine on the matter. Or that vagus nerve, right? That um, I don't remember who the scientist was that found the vagus nerve in the toads. And he was able to kind of reanimate them oh. by, by manipulating it. How fascinating. Yeah, I think. I'd heard something similar uh, with cockroaches, that the, there was this interesting pursuit into making bionic cockroaches because they have so few nerve endings that you can stimulate them with very few connections. I want to say it's something like 16 nerve endings could control a cockroach, which is, wow. uh, you know, not, not my... Uh, not my specialty, not my area of expertise, the bionic cockroach manipulation. <laughs> but, you know, if you read Wired magazine or anything like that, I think it's yeah. been in there and there is some some interest in that. Um, Odo Lowy was the person who discovered, they call it Vegas Stoff. Um, 
born in 1873, but uh, he was able to reanimate toads or frogs. <laughs> was this the basis for uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein? Oh, that's interesting. I feel like this was. I seem to recall reading something about that, that the experiments with the hanging frog legs running electricity through or were so grisly that uh, Mary Shelley based her, you know, what was fundamentally a, a philosophical thought piece on creation and monstrosity on those experiments. Yeah, that's really interesting. It, it might have been, you know, I mean, there have been so many grisly experiments. Yeah. I mean, I guess it makes sense if you have four tons of rattlesnakes that are coming into the town every year and posing some serious danger. Yeah. You know, there has to it's be a way, but ew. <laughs> something incredibly fascinating, though, is uh, so I with my press pass, went out with the team to do the, the rattlesnake catching. Um, and, and you use what looks like a, a mayonnaise jar grabber, those little pinchers that, that you mm-hmm. could use to extend your reach and grab something off the high shelf. Use one of those and just a little pole with a little L-shaped bracket at the bottom. And the idea is you very gently immobilize the snake's head and then support the body so that it can't rip around and hurt itself. And then you put it into a, well, they told you into your snake catching receptacle and no one ever explained what that was supposed to be. Cause <laughs> boy, did I like a bag, a bucket. Some people brought both. Um, it's very weird, but uh, I went out with this woman who was my age at the time. I, I was 36 and she was as well. And she was a grandmother, which culturally made sense for that area uh and Mm -hmm. some of her grandchildren were like on the the hunt with us Uh, so there's a two-year-old boy with a huge pole he was swinging around and it was it was intriguing it was it was different different culture um but she was telling me that the snakes really don't rattle anymore because that was something a friend had prompted me to to ask while i was there was really look into if there is a 50-year legacy of rounding up rattlesnakes, how is it reshaped evolution? Because it will. I mean, 50 years is a a long enough time that if you just grab and eat every snake that rattles at you, the ones that survive and pass on the genetic material are the ones that have become too timid to rattle. And there is a, a, a bit of a genetic push towards behavioral traits so sure enough i I asked her about that so it's like i noticed nothing's really rattling at us the people who catch them are clocking them visually they're not hearing them why aren't they rattling do you remember when you were a little kid did this go differently and she did say that when she was a child 30 years ago uh they did rattle a lot more frequently so in this township they have reshaped evolution to make basically the the T-1000 of rattlesnakes, uh, rattlesnakes that no longer (laughs) rattle because it does not behoove them from an evolutionary standpoint to alert others that they're there and about to bite. So perhaps ironically, they maybe have made a more dangerous rattlesnake um, or they made a more timid rattlesnake. I don't really know. That's fascinating. And so if they're not rattling, how do you find them? Because they're not popping up and going, here I am, right? Yeah. You know, truth be told, we, we just didn't really, well, I, I sure didn't find any. <laughs> um, <laughs> but other people in the group did. They weren't with me when they did. I know one guy, like, there was more drinking than I was anticipating, but I've never gone <laughs> hunting before. So I, I wasn't, I didn't really know what to expect. And obviously this is hunting with a gun, but it's still similar. Apparently you do a lot of drinking. Um, and there, there was one guy who was falling over drunk and he fell over and apparently found himself face first with a large rattlesnake. Oh my gosh. And it was the largest catch of, uh, in our group. He, he then like got up and was like, yeah, that's a rattlesnake and put it in his bucket. And I guess that's. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, my dad. He had a glider. We had a Cessna as well growing up. But um, before he met my mom, he had this glider and he'd go out into the desert. And I guess 
this one time there was a rattlesnake and he caught it, killed it, skinned it, brought it back home and stuck it in the fridge. And he said, you know, when my mom opened that fridge and saw this skinned rattlesnake staring back at her, she just about flipped out, you know, she made him take it out of the house. <laughs> it's just like staring there in, in a bowl, unaware. Oh, that must have just scared her half to death. <laughs> I can imagine. Such a such a thing my dad would do. That's really funny. Um, well, going from rattlesnakes to something similar, you know, we might as well stay in the reptile family. You also covered and learned how to wrestle alligators it's like high altitude alligator wrestling in colorado right yes indeed uh and boy high altitude alligator wrestling not as easy as one would think um (laughs) i i learned quite quickly that i had signed up for an adventure well out of my depth um it was at a, a alligator rescue called colorado gators and it's in this part of southeast colorado that people just don't really go to it's it's not very pretty uh it's Mm. it's near alamosa near the great sand dunes and the great sand dunes are pretty but if you you get far away from them there's nothing out there but there had been this little farm in the area that had tried their hand at aquaponics which is to say a a sort of self-sustaining ecosystem of i want to say algae snails and tilapia And the idea is just with these three ingredients, you have a self-sustaining system and you can snag and eat the tilapia. So you've farmed something that can provide for you and your family with very little need for external activity. But as the story goes, when the tilapia die of natural causes and you can't eat them, there's not a really good method for disposing of them within that ecosystem. So allegedly this little farm had picked up a, a little little alligator and this little alligator was going to feed on the dead tilapia and that was going to preserve the ecosystem. And again, story has it that this little alligator sort of became the darling of the community. People were coming from far and wide to, to look at their alligator. So they got a second <laughs> one and, and started selling tickets to look at their alligators. And, uh, and then they started waking up to alligators left on their front doorstep. Like, oh my gosh. People had, yeah, people had gotten pet alligators, decided they didn't want them. And upon hearing that this little farm had alligators, they're like, well, these people know what to do with them. So oh eventually uh, they weren't a farm anymore. They were an alligator rescue because while it wasn't something they'd volunteered for, now they had a bunch of alligators. They um, had no choice. <laughs> and this is this is on uh, geothermal hot springs as well. So they have these nice warm lakes for the gators. So even in the cold Colorado winters, the uh, gators can stay nice and toasty in the, these uh, these toasty geothermal lakes. But problem being, it's still you know chain link and plywood. It's not an extravagant place. And they need people to volunteer and help medicate them as these alligators fight or get infections, as alligators want to do. So they accept volunteers. So I signed up to take a class on alligator wrestling so I could volunteer and help medicate them and had a intensive single day of training and then wow. medicated a bunch of alligators. And you start out with a, a very tiny one. Um, I think he's only like 10 inches. And they have you pick them up and you feel where the musculature is. And you really feel that they throw around the weight of their tail first and foremost to try and readjust and and snap at you. And that tail can do a lot of damage as they get older. So they're kind of Mm -hmm. dangerous on all six of their pointy ends. Um, But you work your (laughs) way up. You, you, You start with the juveniles, get to the adolescents. And the last one I wrestled was, uh, I want to say 220 pounds. Uh, oh my gosh. Seven feet long. It's really fascinating. You, you have to pull them out of the geothermal hot springs by grabbing their tail and moving backwards gently but rapidly. And they can flip around and, and bite you. They can reach the end of their own tail. So you have to be pulling strongly enough 
the, the, the force prevents them from ripping around. And then you give a last little tug and sort of sit on their rear hips. And at that point, you're almost, uh, almost riding an alligator like a horse. <laughs> and the idea is if you bend over as quickly as you can, get your hands under its jaw, when you lift its jaw up, when you lift its head towards your head, it has the effect of basically picking up a kitten by the scruff of their neck. Because once their front legs are off the ground and once they're adequately folded, they kind of just go limp and stop struggling. And then hopefully you have an assistant who can come up and give them an antibiotic shot or rub Neosporin on any wounds. But I will say the first adult I wrestled sort of became bored with the whole situation because I didn't move fast enough. And he just started walking back into the lake while I am sitting on top of him. Uh, it was seemingly... <laughs> ignorant of the fact that I am on top of them. And it, it felt like I was riding to my death because there's more alligators in that lake. Yeah. <laughs> oh uh, my like gosh. Like a lot more. I think, it, did they have 140 alligators when I went? Oh, that's a lot. How, um, how big was that alligator? I mean, and like your weight versus the alligator's weight, you know, that's just seems crazy to me. Yeah, I, I, I was probably about 210 pounds. Uh, that alligator being the, the first adult I wrestled, I think he was about five or six feet long. He was a little smaller than me. I want to say he was probably a 150 pound alligator, but they, uh, boy, they're built like tanks. Um, mm -hmm. and, and alligators are, they're not as vicious as you would think. I mean, they, they can do a lot of damage and they are dangerous. But if you leave them alone, they they leave you alone. Unfortunately, sitting on one does not constitute leaving one alone. So no. uh, I, I did have one alligator bite through one of my boots, and I was very lucky. I, I kept all my toes, but it did ruin oh, that Oh, my boot. gosh. <laughs> and, you know, just the fact that this one alligator got bored with you, like, all right, well, he's not doing anything. Yeah. I'm going back in the water. He doesn't know what he's doing. It, it just tells you the, they were kind of a little domesticated. Would you say that? Like they're, they're used to the cues um, of somebody's going to come out and feed me. Like these humans are kind of useful. Uh, some of them. Oh, and I'm sorry. I looked up the number. Colorado Gators ha has 270 <sighs> alligators. Um so they're they're very much wild animals. It's very difficult to domesticate a reptile because actually the worst thing that can happen is that they get used to humans because if they're used to you, then they're not scared of you and they might start to consider you mm. prey, um, which is a bigger problem for crocodiles than alligators, really. Um, Colorado gators only has two Nile crocodiles. And then the rest are all alligators spread over uh, 80 acres of geothermal wow. hot springs. So did you meet any of the crocodiles? What Are they much more vicious than an alligator? The crocodiles were remarkably more vicious. I, I had never really thought about it because, I mean, we have alligators here, but especially if you're in California, you don't see any, and they're probably the same as, as crocodiles, but it turns out they're really not. Um, my teacher, who was uh, showing me all the moves, how to immobilize and wrestle them, he took me to the, the crocodile pen and showed me exactly why you don't wrestle mm -hmm. crocodiles. And there was a crocodile sitting there, uh, completely motionless. It looked like a log. And he took a 10-foot pole and, and sort of poked it in the face and there was this blur and we're, we're outdoors and in the sunlight and still the human eye could not track how fast the crocodile was able to whip its head around snap the pole and return to that dormant position it was so vicious and really kind of stuffed mm -hmm. nightmares um so I'm, I'm glad we don't have uh, nile crocodiles sitting around America, with the exception of this rescue, so they they leave the crocodiles alone in their pens. They're they're solo in those pens, so they don't they don't fight each other. They don't get injured, and there's no need to medicate them. But it was it was oh, fascinating. So were those Nile crocodiles abandoned as well? Were they rescued? They were somebody's pet. 
They had to have been someone's pet. He did not give me... Oh, that's my guess. He didn't give me their pedigree. Um, but I know that they at no point have ever purchased any wild animal. They're, they're not considered a private zoo. I know they're not going out and looking for these. So someone must have at some point abandoned or donated wow. one. That's so know. frightening. They also... Yeah, yeah. I guess that's sort of the, the life cycle of uh, the exotic pet, right? You get a an apex predator thinking that you can somehow domesticate and befriend this thing. And once it gets to a certain size, you realize you right. can't. And, uh, and it has to go to a some sort of rescue, which uh, really hopefully showcases why you should not get exotic pets. Absolutely. Really I'm thinking about Reggie the alligator that ended up over at Machado Lake in Harbor City. And, you know, when I was a kid, we would go there and we would ride the paddle boats around the lake. I couldn't imagine riding this paddle boat around the lake and having some alligator just pop its head up. They finally caught it and it's at the L.A. Zoo being taken good care of. Wait, I don't think I heard about this. That's a how how did it end somebody up had it as a pet i think they caught the person i think that there was there was actually uh criminal charges can you imagine being the first person to cite that because what authorities do you call and how do you convince them that you're not crazy <laughs> like announcing you just saw a alligator in a south bay lake <laughs> That would be difficult to take seriously. It was because I know it came out in the Daily Breeze a couple of times that there had been a sighting. And, you know, there's a little, there's several different spots in that park that are just made for children. You know, it's, there's at least four or yeah. five of them and they're right around the lake. You know, and so I know that there was one sighting where a mom was there with her toddler and the toddler started to walk towards the Ooh. alligator because he was laying on the shore oh, no. and she went and swooped up the baby and, you know, made that call. And eventually they took it seriously and went and checked it out. And sure enough, there was an alligator in the lake. Wow. And who who in California has the training to deal with that? I don't know if that's... Uh, <laughs> I, I guess mean, just I, the zookeepers, right? Yeah, um, yeah, I suppose so. Well, I guess I have a certificate. I guess they, if they needed it, wrestled poorly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, how frightening to have to do that. But, um, you know, Shambhala Preserve was the other place I was going to mention, which is Tippi Hendren's place. Oh, yeah. It's up in the Angeles Forest area somewhere. I'd like to say, do they allow the public to visit the Shambhala Reserve? Yes, and you should go if you get the opportunity. It's really amazing. They had uh, panthers, which they said there's no such thing as a panther. They're actually a different cat that ends up with a black coat, but everybody calls it a black panther. And yeah. mountain lions, they have... I don't know if they're still there or not, but the tigers from Michael Jackson's Neverland Ranch that were abandoned after he passed away. And they'll tell you the story about every single one of these cats. Oh. The jaguar that was there was very feral, very upset that we were near him. He was just hissing at us and yeah. crouching low to the ground and its ears were pinned and you know so they told us just walk by really fast past that enclosure but you know there was one cat where they had picked him up as a kitten and they kept him in the house and then when they had to leave they would lock it in this giant room and it was tearing everything up in that room and I guess it was kind of like a giant closet for them so it was eating up everybody's shoes and they couldn't even go in there because the cat was so upset for yeah. having been stuck in this room all day long that, you know, they'd come home and they'd try to play with it and it would want to rip their heads off. So they ended up having yeah. to turn it over. And there was another one who has passed away. It was a lion named Zeus. And that lion was a gift 
to a kid who graduated high school. I can't imagine. <laughs> Here's a lion yeah. for you. The traditional graduation present. Exactly. Here's your exactly. lion. Go to college. What else are you going to give a kid who's got everything, right? So um, it is an interesting place to go yeah. to. And then there's also a wolf rescue place. I've heard about the wolf rescue. It's called Wolf Connection. That's another great place to go to yeah. because they purposely go out and find wolves to rescue. I think most of them are wolf dogs. Yeah. And the sad thing about it is that you can't just release a wolf dog into the wild. Even as a pup, they'll be rejected by right. a pack for not being full wolves and killed. And you can't keep them in captivity. So when animal control gets a hold of them, they are euthanized. So it's um, it's really sad. It's, it's a tragic uh, life for these animals. But fortunately, the ones that are at Wolf Connection live this great life. And they're also in the Angeles Forest. And it's a great place to go and visit. I know... Uh, uh... I was exploring South Africa with some friends and we went to a wild animal rescue because a lot of animals end up orphaned by poachers in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we went to Kangal Wildlife Rescue and they had a cheetah rewilding program, which is incredibly difficult because uh, cheetahs are, they're unique big cats in, in as much as they have an incredible difficulty surviving in the modern world because they're not quite apex predators. They burn a lot of calories making a kill. And then once they've made that kill, it's really easy for a lion or even a jackal to just come over and take what they've killed because they are sort of completely overdrawn. They're sitting under a tree trying to cool their body back down after that caloric expulsion. Uh, but they're also incredibly inbred. So they're having a very hard time creating non-sterile offspring. But uh, what's what's also really curious is they domesticate very easily, which is not a good thing. So anyone who encounters a cheetah and like picks one up and puts it in their truck or whatever, I, I don't know how on earth you would compel a, a cheetah to end up with you. But once you've domesticated it, it's really hard to put it back into the wild. So there's these programs of uh, dubious efficacy, but they're trying. They're really trying to make sure that future generations will have cheetahs. But you see the rewilding center off in the distance. And of course, you as a tourist are not allowed to go there because if you're around the cheetahs, then you are actively preventing them from being rewilded. But they have two ambassadors, maybe even three. And these three ambassadors, they're just never going to be able to be rewilded. So you can go pet and cuddle these ambassadors and it's it's pretty cool and then wow. donate to the cause to get the rest of the cheetahs hopefully rewilded i think you know a lot of these grassroots groups start out meaning really well you know yeah. they're they want to rewild these animals and then it ends up like the alligator farm where somebody goes oh i have a domesticated cheetah for you and before yeah. you know it you've got 100 of them and not enough funds not enough volunteers it's great yeah. that they're doing that though yeah and it gets uh in various uh, i mean animal tourism is always difficult but when you're in impoverished countries trying to ascertain which wildlife rescues are actually even trying to do that and which ones are are just businesses trying to turn a profit uh, is it's difficult opaque and almost impossible for a tourist to have the requisite information because without a full government investigation it's tough to certify that a rescue is really rescuing anything at all and, yeah and I saw some of the some of the research on some of them, you know, like they have the supposed rescue or sanctuaries that will have the young lions and they're anesthetized so that the tourists can come in and take photos with them. And as they grow bigger, they're, you know, people pay the big bucks to go and hunt these lions. And, um, you know, it's just tragic. 
Yeah, I know there was a, a tiger habitat in Thailand that was run by monks. Because uh, when I went to Thailand, I really wanted to see some tigers, and we did a bunch of research into what we should go do if we wanted to be ethical tourists. And there's a lot of feedback that, like, oh, this is run by Buddhist monks, so this is going to be the ethical one. But digging really deep into it, we never went, by the way, but we did find mm-hmm. that, oh, this isn't ethical. The monks are drugging the tigers. And uh, shortly after we went to Thailand and didn't go to this place, it came out, it made international news that there had been a, a large bust at this monastery. And I think arrests were made because they were very, very unethical about how they were dealing with the tigers. And not to mention, um, I don't know if you really, all ethics aside, if you really want to be playing with a tiger that's on or coming off of crazy amounts of drugs, uh, a hungover right. tiger sounds like a bad idea. <laughs> does not sound like any animal that you want to be next to it just is so anti trying to be one with everything and that's just a crazy story there was a uh, theravadic buddhist temple called uh in english tiger temple they, they charge tourists uh low fee to come hang out with their tiger mostly indo chinese tigers And uh, police and wildlife officials removed all living tigers from the Tiger Temple in May of 2016. Oh, that was quite recently. Yep. You know, it kind of reminds me of Pablo Escobar, the cocaine kingpin uh, from Colombia. I think he's passed away, but he brought so many animals in from around the world that they have these hippos that are now proliferating and going into villages and just damaging crops and, you know, scaring the heck out of people. They're very dangerous. Those are so dangerous. I I know. And, you know, so he left behind, this is his legacy, the cocaine hippos is what they call them. And it's in Colombia. There were a bunch of groups going out trying to save them because there was a talk of, you know, basically having the world's largest hippo roundup (laughs) in Colombia. And uh, they have been declared to have human rights. And I don't remember what the exact wording was and how they were able to be declared to be humans. But with that declaration, it gives them a lot more protection so that the groups that are going in to try to save these hippos and provide them the medication that they need. And they're actually trying to figure out how to sterilize them. And this just sounds like, absolutely, I would not want to be trying to sterilize a hippo. And, you know, just the amount of anesthetic that you have to give the hippo. And if you don't knock it out right, it dies. And then something about the way that its entire reproductive system is designed it's really hard to get to the the bits that you need to get to now would they be sterilizing them via surgery or would they use a uh, chemical castration just they're apparently trying to do that the united states has provided them with the birth control chemical castration that they use for deer here in the united mm-hmm. states but they're a lot smaller. So yeah, it's hard to tell how much of a dose these hippos need. And, you know, that was the last thing that I was reading about them. But that was uh, 2021 that I was reading about them. I don't know how close they've gotten to be able to try to stem the problem. But they've got a lot of hippos over there in their Columbia. <laughs> And that would make sense as to how that would spiral out of control because there's there's no predators that can handle hippos really anywhere outside of Africa. So, right. yeah, those absolutely would just rampage through whatever they wanted. <laughs> That's for sure. Seriously, I hope I never accidentally run into a hippo. But... I think all of these stories really illustrate how much animals need our protection and common sense. 
there was really so much packed into this first of my two-part talk with Phil, and part two will not disappoint. It just continues to get more interesting from here. We'll be moving on from animals to his coverage of a UFO convention and so much more. So please come back next week. Also, Phil provided so much great information on color science. And I don't know about you, but I've got a camera that's been lying around in a drawer here in my office. And I'm kind of inspired to pull it apart, just mess around with it a bit and maybe write some code for it. I will let you know how that goes if I actually get to that. But I'm really thinking of replacing an LED with one of those Zigbee controllers. That sounds like a lot of fun. Check out the show notes for links to everything that we talked about. And please keep sending me your questions and suggestions. I love hearing from you. Also, take a moment to rate this episode. Your rating does move this podcast closer to the top of searches so that my friends and I can reach more people. I'm looking forward to sharing more upcoming In the Company of Friends talks with you. So be sure to follow me on the socials and the dot com all at the Queen Trail Podcast. That's T H E Q U A I N T R E L L E Podcast. I am Syl Annan, the Queen Trail, and until next time, I wish you passion, grace, adventure, creativity, elegance, and beauty.